Nice to have you again. It's nice, nice to be here. Nice to be here. Hi, sir. Hello, Demise. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, good evening, guys. Hello. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Uh, good evening sorry sir. about the lighting because uh, there is no power at my area. So, like, uh, evening, using sir. a flashlight. Sorry about that. Uh, anyways, so nice to see you all again. And, uh, welcome, Mr. Master. So, Mr. Uh, Master will be explaining us about, uh, Hinter Master will be explaining us about uh, the advanced astronomy camp. Uh, the paleontology section especially so today is basically a preparatory session which uh, we will be talking to you all about what we will be teaching you all in the advanced astronomy and paleontology course so you all can ask any questions uh, that you all have regarding the program so um, uh, let me pass over the session to uh, mr mason so that he can uh, start introducing the paleontology section of the advanced astronomy camp. Hello, Mr. Mason. Hello, Mr. Sabir, and thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and it's great to meet all of you kids. Uh, I can see some familiar faces in there from uh, my last presentation for you guys. Uh, and I'm so happy to, uh, to be working with you all again. All right, so I'll share my screen here so you guys can see. I've got a little presentation to show you guys. All right. Can you guys see it all right? Uh, yes, Mr. Mason, we can see. And uh, those who have not switched on their cameras, please make sure that you switch it on. All right. So first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. It's nice to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Mason, and uh, I used to work at the Calvert Marine Museum, hunting fossil sharks around 10 million years old, including megalodon, and also some sharks that were around 65 million years old from the end of the time of the dinosaurs. I also worked at the uh, Natural History Society of Maryland, finding people to, uh, to talk to our, uh, to our fossil club members, uh, just like I'm talking to you. I'm currently a student at a place called Stony Brook University, and at Stony Brook University, I work at the Functional Morphology Lab, which I know is a big scary word, but it just means uh, finding out how things move from their bones. Um, but we work on uh, animals like monkeys and apes and uh, lorises. Um, and so that's my research. This summer, I'll be working uh, as an education intern, teaching kids just like you at uh, the Mammoth site in South Dakota, which is in the Western United States. And there's lots of mammoth there. I'm sure you guys all know what mammoths are. And this is, uh, this is me, of course, out here fossil hunting on a river. So I designed this course uh, for you guys. Um, I've, because of the time difference, I've designed it so that uh, Mr. Sabir or whoever is instructing you um, can teach it uh, to you guys, but I'll also always have a pre-recorded video of me at the end so you guys can get some personal interaction with me. And we'll also have, I think, two uh, question and answer sessions so you guys can, answer, can ask me any questions that you uh, get. Um, hopefully in this camp, you'll be learning uh, many different types of sciences, including biology, geology, and chemistry, stuff you guys are going to be uh, hopefully learning in school. It's going to be full of pictures and real world stories because I know uh, it can be easier to connect with stuff that way, and it's always cool to see pictures of really cool uh, fossil creatures. Um, uh, so yeah. So I'm gonna go talk about the modules. So these are gonna be the presentations. Uh, they're gonna be like 30 minutes long, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, and uh, the first one we're gonna start with is gonna be Earth systems, our delicate planet. So that's just showing us how the Earth keeps us alive, the different systems that are 
always maintained in balance? Um, and what happens when humans interact with these systems? Um, and how do these systems in, in, interact with life on Earth? This is going to be things like the water cycle and the oxygen cycle and carbon cycle, basic stuff that's going to be really important for you guys going forward. Module two is going to be about Earth structures. So we're going to take a journey to the center of the Earth, basically. We're going to find out what uh, the planet Earth is made of. We're going to see what forces shape the, place of the face of the planet. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to touch on earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, and we're going to figure out uh, how all of this works. Uh, and we're also going to figure out, we're going to talk about who discovered this stuff. In module three, we're going to get into geosciences. As you probably know, fossils are found in rock, so we need to understand how to read rocks like their books. Um, so to do this, we're going to learn how rocks are made and how they're classified. And then we're going to see what do those rocks tell us about the place in which they were formed. Then we're going to learn how people called stratigraphers uh, basically look at the layers of the rock and turn it into a story that we can all read. And you guys are going to be able to do that by the end. Uh, and module four is going to be called atoms and volcanoes, which is pretty cool, I think. It's going to ha have relative dating in it. Uh, you guys probably don't know what that is right now, but you will. Um, how can we tell rocks are, are the same age in different places? So if I find a rock in, uh, in America and you guys find one in Sri Lanka, how do we know which one's older and which one's younger and, uh, or if they're the same age? Um, we're going to see how we can use fossils to tell us how old rocks are. And then we're going to talk about radioisotope dating, uh, which is uh, very, uh, which is going to sound scary, I know, but it's, it's actually very understandable. And that's going to be the atoms part. Um, and these atoms actually, we'll find out, come from volcanoes. And uh, why are absolute dates important? Absolute dates are how old something is in years. Um, and we're going to talk about how, that's, how we figure that out. In module five, we're going to be talking about evolution and natural selection. Hopefully, this is stuff you've either already learned in school or going to learn in school. Uh, but I'm just going to give you a sneak peek or reinforce uh, what you already know. We're going to talk about this guy, Charles Darwin. He came up uh, with evolution. Uh, and we're going to talk about what his theory means. Um, and it's actually very simple. There's only a, a few rules to it. And we're going to talk about how new traits are created new uh, features are created and how they're passed to the next generation through this fun little molecule called DNA. In module six, we're going to get to what you guys have all been waiting for, which is uh, what is paleontology. And we're going to talk a little bit about the history of paleontology, how it came to be, um, and how do paleontologists become deep time detectives and uh, learn, study the past as if it's a crime scene. And then we're going to see uh, what are the, sub, the subfields that are included in paleontology. Paleontology covers all the life that used to live on Earth. Um, so you guys are going to learn that there's actually specific types of paleontologists. And I'm going to introduce you to some of them uh, through some pictures and talking about them, some of my personal friends. And then we're going to talk about why does paleontology matter at all to you guys. Um, in module seven, we're going to talk about fossils themselves and how they're created and taphonomy. Taphonomy is just everything that happens to a creature after it dies. So we're going to say, see, how are these fossils preserved? Um, and you're going to see some really pretty cool fossils. Uh, what biases affect the fossil record? If you don't know what the word biases means, I, uh, that's a little piece of homework for you guys. Uh, we'll, they'll go over it again once we get there. And we're going to learn about why absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, which I know is a funny turn of phrases, but that's going to be something that's very important in any science that you guys ever learn about. And then we're going to talk briefly about what, are, what fossils are found in your home of Sri Lanka. Uh, so that you guys can have a, a good appreciation and understanding of the fossils of your country. In module eight, we're going to talk about, we're going to go over a brief history of Earth, uh, or of life on Earth. So four and a half billion years of Earth history. We're going to go through all of it and see all the cool animals that used to live here um, in the past. And we're going to use the uh, geologic time scale here. Uh, we're going to figure out how life began and how it uh, and um, and when. We're going to talk about major in events that influence influence the course of life, including the big five extinction events. You probably know about the one that killed the dinosaurs, but that one wasn't even close to the worst. Um, and we're going to talk about how humans came into being, how you and I came into being, and then we're going to uh, briefly mention what the future holds um, because. Part of the point of paleontology is learning from the past so we can predict the future. 
in module nine, you guys are gonna be able to ask me questions. Uh, I'll zoom in like this, and you guys can ask me about literally anything in the course you want to, or anything paleontology related. Uh, I think when I was asked to do this, they, they, made, they asked me to make it, ask a paleontologist about dinosaurs, but I wanna make sure that you guys can ask me about anything, including dinosaurs. I'm not a dinosaur paleontologist, uh, but I've taken courses on them, and I've, uh, I know a little bit about them. In module 10, we're going to talk about how to become a paleontologist, and that could mean becoming a professional paleontologist, and then in that case, we're going to talk about career paths um, and what challenges that you might face becoming a paleontologist. Um, but I'm also going to talk about how to be a paleontologist, even if you don't work in it, even if just to think like a paleontologist, uh, to hunt fossils if you want to, and uh, to take the lessons you learn from paleontology and apply them to other sciences. So you guys can do great in whatever ever, uh, subject you study, because I know you guys are all very smart uh, kids. And in module 11, we're going to do uh, another question and an answer session. You uh, can ask me about anything paleontology related again. Um, I think officially on the sheet, it's uh, asked me about uh, Velociraptor's family. We have a nice Velociraptor here fighting uh, a Protoceratops. They were preserved in this really cool fashion uh, where they were still fighting. Uh, but you don't just have to, you, you can ask me about anything, not just Velociraptors. Um, but I'll, I'll make sure to read up on Velociraptors so I can answer those questions as well. So that's everything I have um, for you guys today, uh, talking about uh, the course. Do you guys have any questions as to, uh, to, as to what you're gonna be learning? If we learn about, uh, if we learn how to read the fossils, that means to say what animals they are, like those stuff. Yeah, so we're gonna be talking in, um, in this section. We're going to be learning about uh, where I'm actually going to show you guys four fossils or I'm going to teach you some stuff and then I'm going to give you four fossils or rather Mr. Sabir is going to teach you some stuff. Then you're going to see four fossils and you're going to be able to look at those fossils and tell what the environment was like. It's actually going to be four fossils that could be found in Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going and you guys are going to kind of be walked through the process of like, hmm, if we have this here, how do we figure out what type of animal this is? How do we figure out what this animal means about the environment? And how can we kind of create like a picture of like what the world used to look like at that time? Um, so yeah, you're gonna be able to learn to read fossils, uh, hopefully um, in this course. I hope that answers that question. Yes, Adisha, you can ask your question. So what fossils we found in Sri Lanka? Yeah, so we're going to go over that in this one, but uh, I can tell you right now in cursory that it's, uh, it's there's uh, ma three major time periods that fossils are found, actually four major time periods that fossils are found from in Sri Lanka. Um, the oldest one is known as the, uh, the Permian. Um, you guys may have heard of the Great Dying or the Permian Extinction, or maybe you guys have heard of like Demetrodon, cool things like that. Those are from the Permian. Um, and uh, currently only plants have been found from uh, in the Permian uh, from a place called the Tabua Basin in Sri Lanka. Um, also in that same place, there are things from when the dinosaurs lived during the Jurassic period. Again, plants are the only thing that's been found there currently, but maybe you guys can be the first to find a dinosaur there. Um, the second major time period is the one I've uh, kind of been alluding to about uh, the other things is from the Miocene. So it's about 10 million years ago. It's the same stuff I study. Uh, it's found in Northern Sri Lanka. There are things, Megalodon has not been found there, but it's very likely that it someday will. Um, there's, uh, it's a marine environment with lots of cool sharks and things and seashells. Um, and the last one is uh, the Pleistocene. You may have heard of it called the Ice Age. Um, and during that time, there were lots of cool mammals living in Sri Lanka, um, and including humans uh, at, towards the end of it. Um, so there's, it's, uh, th there are three major time periods in Sri Lanka. So I hope uh, you guys uh, can be more interested in it as you go forward. And if you guys ever find a fossil, you'll know what it is. And if you become a paleontologist, that you can be able to study the paleontology in your country. I see there's a hand raised from uh, Binal up there. Excuse me. Uh, 
I really like Titan boa have uh, bones to be buried and be found? Yes, uh, I, we will be mentioning Titanoboa actually. Um, so like I said, I'm going to have little pre-recorded videos uh, that Mr. Spear is going to play for you. And one of those videos is going to be me um, talking. It's actually, I think, in this lecture uh, where I'm going to be showing you guys some uh, cool fossil sites from around the world. Actually, no, it's not. It's going to be in, um, in this one. Um, so Titanoboa is actually from right when the dinosaurs died, right after it. So when I'm talking about that time period, the Paleocene, I will be showing you uh, Titanoboa's uh, like environment. Um, Titanoboa is only currently known from a few vertebra. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's the largest snake that ever lived. Um, I think it's like 20 meters long. I might be wrong on that though, because sometimes I'm not good at converting meters to feet. We use a uh, feet in America. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about not just about Titanoboa, but it will also mention the things that lived alongside it. There was a giant crocodile that used to that has really strong jaws that used to crack open turtles there were giant turtles there and there were also um uh like lots of other cool creatures which hopefully i'll be able to mention uh for you guys uh so yes we definitely will talk about titanoboa um yeah so i hope that answers that question okay thank you <laughs> you're welcome I'm not going to stop sharing here. Any other questions? No. Uh, I can't hear you, Mr. Sabir, if you're talking. Sorry. Sorry about that. The mic no was muted. Sorry. All right. So uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr. Mason. It looks like a really interesting syllabus and the kids are excited as well. So we'll hopefully uh, do a great job in the uh, upcoming advanced astronomy camp. Thank you very much. So now, uh, kids, I will be showing you what we will be learning under the astronomy uh, side of the advanced astronomy camp. So let me share the screen. Right, okay. So this is the astronomy section of it. So Mr. Mason uh, explained about the paleontology side. So as for the topic one, we'll be learning about galactic and extra galactic astronomy and cosmology. So what this basically means is that uh, we'll be learning about our galaxy, which is the Milky Way, and also other galaxies that are away from our galaxy, right? So the galaxies that we don't belong in. So for starting off, since we are going to talk about cosmology, I will be explaining about what are atoms, uh, how it is formed, and what are the subparticles within an atom. And uh, going on with that, I will talk about matter in detail uh, till the cosmos, in the sense formation of stars and planets. And next up, we'll be talking about the light in the universe, the first lights that were emitted after the Big Bang explosion. Right. So that will also be discussed in this uh, first lesson. And second, we, uh, third, we will be talking about the grand tour of galaxies. So what's that about is basically, uh, we'll be looking into each and every type of galaxies. I think you guys remember, we did a subject called galaxies in our basic astronomy camp. So over here, we'll be looking into that in much detail. Uh, we'll be learning about different uh, segments, different parts of a galaxy and what are their uh, meaning and their behavior, their characteristic Right, And also we'll be talking about the Megalonian uh, cloud in the uh, Milky Way galaxy. And then fourth, we'll be talking about quasars and the meaning of cosmic expansion, uh, how the entire universe is expanding and why is it expanding. So that's for the first uh, uh, topic. Moving on to the second topic, this is about extraterrestrial intelligence. So even in our basic astronomy camp, we learned about extraterrestrial beings. So over there, I was talking to you about um, uh, you know, exoplanets and how there are chances of uh, life being uh, formed in those planets. And also uh, was talking about uh, what are the possibilities of finding them? What are the ways, what are the uh, methods that are used by humans in order to find for these extraterrestrial beings? 
So here we will be talking about them in much detail. So first of all, we have something called microbial SETI. So SETI basically means search uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So here it's about microbial uh, SETI, which basically means how uh, searching for rather than multicellular complex organisms, we will be focusing on uh, single cell organisms like bacteria, uh, viruses, stuff like that. And then second is the detection of phosphine in Venus. So recently, I guess around 2020, uh, scientists found that there is phosphine uh, in Venus. So this phosphine uh, compound is basically released only when there is uh, living organisms uh, in a certain place. So this is uh, giving us a lot of uh, high hopes that there may be some sort of living uh, organisms in Venus. So we'll talk about that as well. And next uh, is, can artificial intelligence help find alien intelligence, right? So these days we all use artificial intelligence for so many stuff. So even artificial intelligence is used currently to find for alien life beyond planet Earth. So lastly, what evolutionary theory can teach us about the appearance of aliens? So I remember when we, we were talk, when we were learning about the ex, uh, extraterrestrial topic in our astronomy camp, most of the kids had this question of how do aliens look like? Uh, what is their appearance? Do they look like humans? Do they look like, you know, uh, very different from how a human will look like? So all those questions uh, will be hopefully answered in this part. And next we have the third topic, which is basically astrobiology. So this basically means biology outside planet Earth, right? So things that we currently don't know, don't have any idea of because we are only familiar with biology within Earth. So over here, uh, we will be talking about origin and evolution of planetary systems, how they came into existence, and then origin of organic compound in space, right? So there are so many organic compounds that are found in space. So how do they come into existence? And then rock, water, carbon interaction, and then biosignatures as facilitating life detections, right? So if there is any biosignature, for example, uh, the one I told you about the Venus, right? So phosphine, yeah. so stuff like that are discovered uh, not all the time, but um, sometimes there are biosignatures that are picked up by various uh, probes and satellites. So we will be talking about that too in this topic three, astrobiology. So moving on to topic four, this is basically astronomical research. So there are different types of astronomical research. So I have picked out uh, three most important uh, astronomical uh, research that will be very familiar to you guys as well, because uh, we have learned somewhat about these in the basic astronomy camp as well. So the first one that I'll be talking about is the space time and how it is defined. Right, so space time, uh, we learned about space time fabric, right? So here we'll be talking about that and uh, we'll be discussing about research theories that are produced by famous astronauts and astrophysicists. Second, mass exploration. The red planet has many secrets, right? So uh, we also uh, found out that there are polar caps in the Mars planet, in the Martian planet, and also uh, there may be underwater uh, oceans that may uh, that that are currently being discovered in the Martian planet. So we'll be talking about that. And lastly, how did asteroid belt appear? So we know what the asteroid belt is. So here we will be talking about how it came into existence and why is it there. So those are the three uh, research uh, astronomical research papers that we will be talking about. So the topic five is dark matter and dark energy. So this is something which. Um, uh, what do you call it? Dr. Julian Onions, right? So Dr. Julian Onions actually joined us one day and he was explaining about these two uh, topics, dark matter and dark energy. So we will be talking about that as well. So this is basically two main uh, concepts. So that's basically dark matter being the invisible glue, which holds the entire universe in place. And that's the reason why uh, the entire universe is in existence. And the next is dark energy. What is making the universe expand and what is uh, making stuff drift away from each other. So these are the two concepts and we will talk about them as well and the relationship between dark matter and dark energy and why is it important even though we are unable to detect them in real life. Uh, topic six, matter and antimatter. So as of now, we have very good knowledge of matter 
and we do not have you know enough substantial information about antimatter but we have few things that we can we can talk about which is basically what is matter and its property uh, since most of you guys uh, have very less idea about matter in detail so over here i will be talking about those uh, how matter can exist and what are the types of uh, you know uh, ways that matter can uh, you know exist like for example the properties of liquid solid and gas and even plasma so second is relationship between states of matter so the relationship between the each uh, types of matters that i mentioned earlier next is what is antimatter and its properties so basically the antimatter in um, to make it simpler it's basically the exact opposite of matter right so we'll be talking about what it is why is it the exact opposite of matter why did uh, matter and antimatter came into existence after the big bang and uh, what is its specific properties and also what is antimatter and how is antimatter made right so those will also be discussed in this topic six moving on to topic seven this is asteroid impact avoidance uh, mr mason joined us i guess uh, one and a half months ago he was talking about the chicxulub impact right so if, what if something like that happens in future uh, hopefully it doesn't but if something like that is to happen we do have few ways to prevent it and uh, identify and detect it even before the asteroid comes closer to the earth's atmosphere so we'll be talking about how to deflect an asteroid uh, five steps to prevent asteroid impacts and potentially hazardous asteroids that are there in space that may have chances of uh, you know uh, causing harm to our planet earth so that's topic seven topic eight uh, it's about space laws space colonization and space industries we know we are doing research and our planning of uh, you know colonizing mars and if they do colonize mars definitely space law must be implemented right like how we have space law uh, like how we have a general law in uh, planet earth we should also have certain laws that may be implemented in those uh, colonized planets as well and not only that we do have certain set of laws that are followed in the iss in the international space station right so we'll be talking about those laws in detail so what is space law treaties and principles pertaining to it and second the future of space colonization and ter terraforming so the future of space colonization as of now we know that we'll be colonizing mars in another few years probably in a decade within a decade and uh, also there are uh, ways how we are planning to terraform mars basically to convert mars atmosphere into a hospitable environment so that's basically about terraforming so is it only possible for mars only of a martian territory or is it possible even for other planetary bodies so that will be discussed here and the third is commercial space age commercial space age means basically how we are going to harvest stuff that are in space and uh, use it for our advantage gain uh, natural resources from stuff that are there in the uh that are there in space for example we know that there are certain asteroids which are made up of you know full of iron ore certain uh certain asteroids do have uh certain elements that are very rare to be found on planet earth so how are we going to you know make use of them space mining and stuff will be discussed in this part and fourth is privatized space exploration so i'm not sure if you guys have heard of this but that it's a company called Virgin Galactic. So that company basically uh, focus on uh, space exploration. That's basically we call it as space tourism, where they take people for money in order for them to explore space to just to get the zero gravity experience. So how that will be carried out in future? What's the future of this industry? So those will be talked uh, in this topic eight. Uh, so topic nine is about orbital mechanics so this is mostly to do with physics so here we'll be talking about the newton's laws of motion and universal gravitation uh, the connection between it the four laws of newton and how are the equations that were brought forward by newton can be applied for these uh, celestial bodies and also uniform circular motion uh, which i'll be discussing in detail because it's kind of a bit complicated for you guys 
to understand. And the next is launch of space vehicles. So here we'll be talking about projectiles, how uh, a way, how actually a rocket is launched into space because we when we watch videos on YouTube, it just looks very simple, right? The rocket is just blasted off into space, but that's not exactly true because there is a lot of work that has to be done because um, there is a reason why when we launch a certain aircraft, a certain spacecraft that it lands where it is supposed to be landed. So there's a physics behind it. So we will be talking about that. And next is motion of planets and satellites. So you guys know that satellites are in orbit around planet Earth, right? So why is it not just drifting away uh, into outer space? So those things will be discussed in motions of planets and satellites. Uh, so that will be under topic nine. So then we come to topic 10, aerospace engineering. So in aerospace engineering, we have aeronautics. So what is aeronautics? Aeronautics basically means design, engineering, and development of aircraft or spacecraft, right? So how uh, are spacecraft designed? Uh, what are the, uh, you know, fuel efficient models for a spacecraft? All those stuff will be discussed under aeronautics. And next we have aerodynamics. You can't just simply make a aircraft to fly, right? So there has to be certain, uh, you know, ways of modeling a aircraft in order for it to uh, adhere to, you know, yaw friction, yaw resistance, and uh, be able to fly up in the sky. And even for spacecrafts to, you know, reach the escape velocity of planet Earth and go into outer atmosphere of planet Earth. So all those will be discussed in under aerodynamics. Next is space flight. So here we'll be talking about space probes and mostly rockets. So fourth is space mission analysis and design. Uh, what are the steps that are taken in order to um, in order for a space mission and uh, in order to make a space mission successful? What are the procedures? How it is handled? How it is managed? All those will be discussed here. So that's the last part of topic ten. Moving on to topic eleven. Here we have bioastronautics. So how biology or how uh, living beings uh, behave and uh, you know uh, yeah basically behave in uh, in in space outside planet earth right so here we'll be talking about space habitation so space habitation is nothing new to us we have been doing it for a couple of years now iss is a good example of that so how people live there how is life different from uh, planet earth compared to the iss so those will be discussed there and neuroscience in space. Neuroscience is basically about uh, the brain of human, right? So how, how our, um, you know, the brain and the nervous system function in space. And next is medicine in space. How is medical, medical uh, research conducted in space? And why do we conduct medical research in space? What's the benefit behind it? And uh, what are the findings that we have found by conducting uh, medical research in space. Why is it beneficial? Those will be discussed here. And life support system. So here, for example, I can talk, I can give you an example about cryogenics, where they freeze an entire human body uh, and probably revive them back after some time. So this is just experimental. No one had done it uh, successfully until now, but it is a topic that is still in discussion. So maybe humans will be possible to, you know, make that uh possible in future but for now it's not right so we'll be talking about that and topic 12 is about robotics so here we'll be talking about x-ray evolving universe spectroscopy so this is basically uh, uh, a device which is used to find the evolution of universe uh, how the universe is evolving what is uh, why is it evolving all those details are found using this specific device and the next is european robotic arm this is basically um, a robotic arm that's fixed to the Russian module of the ISS. So we'll be talking about that too. And then uh, further roles of robotics in astronomy. So here we do know uh, the Curiosity rover, stuff like that, uh, which are, falls under the robotics uh, sector. But uh, these robotics are not functioning on planet Earth, but outside planet Earth. So all those will be discussed in this topic so that is basically it for the astronomy side of the advanced astronomy camp so if you do have any questions you all can ask me. yes what's your question uh, sir are we going to uh, learn something about spacex 
SpaceX. Yeah. Yes, of course, we will be learning about SpaceX. So SpaceX will be learned under this topic. Uh, space law, space colonization, and space industry. So here we'll be talking about SpaceX, uh, Blue Horizon, and many other uh, space exploring companies. Yes. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Um, yes, Sudhir. Elon, Elon Musk is also trying to um, Yes, Elon that's Musk. right. Hopefully. So yesterday I uh, did so much research about the Mars and Rover and the Mars uh, drone like what? Sorry, uh, I didn't get it. Binal, can you repeat again? Uh, I did the research about the Mars Rover and the... Oh, okay. Uh, and there's a drone like one to uh, colonize. Mars. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Right. Anyone anyone has any questions? Y'all can ask if y'all do have questions. Not only from me, even Mr. Mason is here. So y'all can ask from Mr. Mason too. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Does Dr. Julietanian still join in our advanced yes. astronomy? Yes, of course. He will be joining us uh, once in a while, right? So definitely he'll be joining us and he'll be sharing us materials as well uh, related to astronomy. So yeah, so he'll be joining us, uh, Ayush. And many more other professionals will be joining. Anyone else got any questions? Sir, when are we going to have the session like with uh, Dr. Julian Onions. Okay, so when we'll be having the next uh, session with Dr. Julian Onions. Yeah, so probably very soon. I think on May we will be having a session with him. We will give you all a notice when we do have it. Okay. And Mr. Mason too will be joining us certain days. Okay. And I also uh, might want to let you guys know that um, I'm going to hopefully, because I'm going to be working at that mammoth site, so hopefully I'll be able to give you guys a tour of the mammoth site and show you guys some uh, some mammoth um, uh, and things. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you guys know about that, or Mr. Sabir will let you guys know about that uh, when we have the details sorted out. But I think you guys will enjoy it. I'm currently excited. I even I want to see that. It'll be really cool. So any any questions, guys? You got. Uh, forty-five minutes. So you can you can ask any questions that are related. Doctor Mason, uh, are there something else like uh, bones in other planets? Um, I think so. Mister Sabir will be talking to you guys about the, the the search for life on other planets. Um, and the answer is. We are definitely looking, we are definitely have people who have the skills of a paleontologist who are looking on other planets uh, to try to see if there are fossils on other planets. They haven't found anything yet. Um, but the same skills that you're learning in paleontology will, would definitely be applicable in uh, trying to learn about other forms of life. There was a meteor um, which actually came from Mars. Um, sometimes a, a, a asteroid will hit Mars and it'll blast the rock off Mars and then it'll hit Earth. Um, and it was found in Antarctica and it had um, what almost looked to be a fossil uh, uh, in it. Um, now we think it's probably not a fossil, um, but the fact that we were able to, you know, see it and recognize that it might be shows that, yeah, we could totally in the future, if, uh, if there is indeed life on other planets, there will be fossils of it and we'll be able to find it because all planets work the same way, even if they have different conditions. And one, one of the things we'll be learning about is something called uniformitarianism, which is a big scary word, but all it means is that things are today how they were in the past. Uh, things don't change, all the processes work the same way. Uh, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, excuse me, sir. Um, I think I have heard of um, a memo uh, found in the Taranza and Excuse me, Dr. I, Mason, I have another question. Uh, did the dinosaurs die? Uh, did another type of uh, 
So there were two questions there. I think the first one was about uh, a mammoths. Um, and mammoths are, are a large elephant um, covered with hair that used to live in the northern parts of both Europe and Asia and North America. Um, and the site that I hopefully will be able to show you is from the Colombian mammoth, which is the mammoth that lives in North America. Although I think there's three woolly mammoths as well. Um, and they're all male, which is a big, we don't know why that is. Um, but um, mammoths are, yeah, they can, you can't find, I'm not sure, I didn't hear the question exactly right, but I think you said you heard that mammoths were found uh, preserved in the permafrost, and that is correct. We have um, soft tissue preservation. We know almost exactly what these mammoths look like. Uh, we're, we have DNA from these mammoths. Um, I'm not sure we'll be able to recreate them, uh, but we can uh, definitely learn a lot about them from that. Um, yeah, and so yeah, mammoths are really cool. Um, and even though you don't have mammoth in Sri Lanka, you do have uh, lots of fossils from fossil elephants in Sri Lanka from many uh, different okay, types. Um, and I think the second one, the second question was about dinosaurs, right? Uh, uh, wait, can we have uh, Binal first and then the second person? Guys, please uh, raise your hands if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. Vina? The serial dinosaurs died like the 60s. Uh, did another mammal uh, walk there? So, um, yeah, so the dinosaurs, other than the birds, died 65 million years ago when the, when the big meteor struck. Um, when they died, almost all of them died very quickly, where quickly geologically speaking, because uh, t there's a lot of time. So um, it probably took like a century or so. But um, we, when the dinosaurs died, they were very quickly replaced by mammals, um, like you and I. Uh, and in fact, our ancestors, the primates, evolved at this time. Um, so yeah, they were replaced very quickly by them. But it wasn't at all clear originally that that mammals were going to be the ones who replaced them. Um, and at this time, mammals looked very different from mammals of today. And you'll see some pictures of it, hopefully, in the brief history of, of life. Um, but uh, yeah, we there was also, we, you mentioned Titanoboa. There were a lot of other reptiles that could, looked like maybe they were going to rule the world. And there was also birds, which are a type of dinosaur. At this time, we had these uh, terror birds, these massive, scary birds uh, that ruled the world as well. So that is... Uh, so it, yeah, there are definitely a lot of cool stuff happening right after the dinosaurs died, but you were correct, the mammals did win out. I have another question. Uh, there was a, a theory like uh, the ancient people killed dinosaurs to eat. Is that real? No, that is not real. And uh, you're gonna be learning in that brief history of life that uh, Dinosaurs and humans are separated by about 60 million years. Um, we started evolving 7 million years ago from apes. Dinosaurs had already been dead for, you know, 60 million years by then. Uh, so a human never met a dinosaur. So they never could interacted in any way other than birds. Um, that said, we did interact with things like mammoth and uh, other Pleistocene uh, faunas. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have heard, uh, I have heard that um, uh, that when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, I have heard that there was a type of beast in the Indian Ocean that was seen to be fossilized. And when they said it was actually, uh, it survived. I didn't hear that last part. Could you say that again? Um, actually, I told that um, um, that yeah, but they told that they told that uh, that because it because the need to happen, it was survived. Uh, because it was in Indian Ocean, and then when they check, uh, it was some found. It is called a colagant. 
so yeah, when the when the meteor hit, there was also at the same time a. I'm sorry if you uh, hear some stuff. I'm in a public place. Um, the, the there was also volcanoes that went off in uh, the Indian subcontinent at the same time, and that may have had something to do uh, with the meteor, and it may have had something to do with the dinosaurs dying, because it was. An, we're going to be talking about the largest volcanoes of all time, uh, so I hope you guys find that interesting, and that's going to be on there. It's one of the largest ones in history. And yeah, and the Indian subcontinent has, first of all, there are dinosaurs in India. Um, and there's also lots of fossils throughout India and Bangladesh and Pakistan and Nepal. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff that happens there right after the dinosaurs die, because India was actually an island uh, and Sri Lanka was part of that island. And there's a lot of cool stuff that goes on there because of the isolation. And there's also the first uh, whales you're going to be learning about came from the Indian subcontinent in the, the ocean that used to exist between India and Asia. I have one more question to ask. Um, I have heard that um, some people thought that uh, that when the, when when fully mammoth arrived, yeah, there are some believe that uh, we have been killing them. So we know that human. We know that humans definitely hunted um, mammoth. We have found their bones with cut marks on them. We found houses made out of their bones and things. Um, we're not, it seems that maybe we weren't the thing that made them go extinct. We may have been part of it, but the climate actually changed at the same time. And so that probably did that, um, but we did definitely hunt mammoth. Uh, that is something that humans across Eurasia and North America did. Um, I have another question to, to ask. Um, uh, and uh, was, uh, what did, uh, did the Titanoboa and Megalodon stay at the same period? Can, can you repeat the question? Uh, I, it's a little loud over here. Um, uh, did, uh, did the Titanoboa and Megalodon were, were they in the same uh, They were not. The Titanoboa is actually older, but at the same time Titanoboa was alive, the ancestor of Megalodon is called Ototus obliquus. It's a little smaller. It doesn't have serrated teeth, uh, so its teeth aren't like don't don't look like a knife. Um, but it was also a massive shark, bigger than any alive today, and they were alive at the same time. But they would not have met each other because Titanoboa is a freshwater creature. Um, whereas these sharks are uh, saltwater creatures. There are freshwater sharks, but we don't have any evidence of them at this place. Um, I have my, uh, and my last question is, how did um, Borothraptors look like in the past? H how did what look like in the past? Um, uh, Borothraptors. So um, I, you guys may have seen like Jurassic Park or other things with, uh, with velociraptors in them. They're a little bit of a lie. There are, there are relatives of velociraptor that look like that, but in real life, a velociraptor was about the size of a turkey, uh, or I guess you guys don't have turkeys. Uh, they, were, they were about knee height. Um, so, so they were actually very small. They looked a lot like birds, but they had teeth and they were definitely a scary creature. Um, I showed you that picture of the one fighting with a protoceratops. Protoceratops is kind of like a triceratops. It's an ancestor of it, except it's rather small as well, also about knee height. Um, so these are, so Velociraptor was a, a small feathery bird-like creature, uh, but it was, and don't get me wrong, they're probably scary. We don't know if they hunted in packs, um, but they're, they're a cool creature, definitely. They're probably very colorful too, although we don't have any evidence. Uh, do duckbills uh, hunt creatures? Uh, do what hunt creatures? Duckbills. Duckbill. No, duckbill dinosaurs are a, a type of dinosaur which is a herbivore. They eat plants. Um, and they actually, if you look at their teeth, 
they're very similar to what we have today in cows and in horses. So they were probably, they didn't actually, I, I know this is crazy, but at this time, grass had just evolved. It was not very common. In some places, gr grass just didn't exist yet, um, which I know it's weird to think about. You know, you go outside and there's grass everywhere, right? But that just wasn't the way it was. Um, so they were eating probably like foliage, like leaves and things um, for the most part. And they have these grinding teeth that kind of grind them into like a paste. And then they probably have multiple stomach, they have uh, stomachs and they have, they eat rocks called gastroliths. So they eat a rock that helps them digest the tough, uh, tough leaves so they can get all of the nutrients out of it. Um, I have a question to ask. Um, did, uh, did, how did it take a saw? How did it take a saw that? Um, uh, yeah, I have heard that it took a saw that has some, like, when, when they want, when, like, he lets us, I want to eat, take a saw that. I have, I have like heard that they are, that the penises are just like a sort of play that, that happens. Uh, so you you were kind of cutting out for me, um, but the Stegosaurus is a creature from the Jurassic, so it's actually the same amount of time or the same time period as some fossils in Sri Lanka, um, although they're currently only known from North America and the western part of Europe, uh, a place called Portugal. Um, and Stegosaurus, yeah, it has these big plates on its back, and uh, there's a lot of debate as to what they do. We do know, because from paleontology, we learned how to read bones, right? We know that they were full of veins, um, lots of blood flow to them. So the two biggest, the, the, the biggest theories are, A, it could be used for uh, what we call thermoregulation, which is just keeping yourself at the right temperature, um, and by getting these big, you know, flat things that creates a, like a, it, it has more surface area so it can cool off quicker or heat up quicker. And uh, the other idea is maybe it's used for display. Maybe when the blood was pumped into these things, it changed color, um, which would have been really cool to look at, right? Um, and that helps them attract mates uh, to look pretty. Um, and uh, yeah, so those are kind of the main ideas that we're going for there. And a lot of dinosaurs have these kind of weird, uh, you know, bony things on them. And if you think about things today, you know, there's lots of animals which have really cool structures on them, you know, things on their head and like things on their arms and feathers and stuff that wouldn't normally preserve. So we always have to remember when we're looking at fossils that we're definitely missing things. Excuse me, Mr. Mason. Mm -hmm. uh, how many dinosaurs are there that is vegetarian? Yeah. Um, so in every environment, um, they're usually the most common creatures are, are vegetarian. Most common creatures are herbivores because there's a lot of plants around. But if you want to be a carnivore and, you know, eat other things, you have to eat a lot of herbivores in order to survive. So there's usually many fewer predators than there are herbivores. Um, so there was lots of plants alive at this time, just like there are today. So that's how the herbivores uh, evolved into all these different, what we're gonna call, and you're gonna learn about niches or lifestyles, um, specializing in eating different things. So yeah, there was a lot, there was actually many more herbivorous dinosaurs than there were carnivorous dinosaurs. I hope that answers that question. I have, uh, I have a question to ask. Uh, um, uh, how did uh, us human humans evolve? Evolve. So we're going to be talking about that in the course. Um, humans evolved from apes. Uh, so if you guys know about chimpanzees, if you go nice know about uh, gorillas, orangutans. Um, we came from those, uh, and the first thing that changed was we were able to walk, and there are several different reasons why that may have happened. Um, and then later, over time, our brain increased in size, and that's why we're, uh, that's what's led to all these smart children in front of me today. Um, and yeah, we'll talk more in depth about that in the course. Uh, but yeah, it's a very cool, it's my subject of research, so it's a very cool thing and something very near and dear to my heart. Mr. Matson, I have a question. Uh, uh, how did, uh, uh, did uh, 
turtles stay uh, in the period of dinosaurs? Yes, turtles are actually very ancient. Turtles came before the dinosaurs. Uh, they were there in the Permian, which I was talking about, and they were there in, uh, or, well, I should say their ancestors were there in the Permian. They evolved in the Triassic around the same time as dinosaurs, like true turtles. Um, I'm not sure I have anything in this course specifically, but maybe at some point in the future, I can talk about some other things, um, including the way that the turtles evolved. And it's something that's actually very recently we've learned a lot more about. Um, but during the whole time of the dinosaurs, there were turtles. Some of them were massive um, and they were a very important part of their ecosystem. And they're still alive today. Uh, how about we, uh, I see that um, the person whose name is Imolka here has uh, had their hand raised for a long time. Excuse me. Who's, what's the uh, animal that has the biggest teeth? So the biggest teeth depends on what you define as tooth. Um, but the biggest teeth in a jaw so sometimes our teeth like evolve into like horns and things like if you think about it a narwhal which is a type of whale that lives up in canada they have a really long like tusk but that's actually like a, a tooth that's been evolved in that fashion but the biggest tooth that's like in a mouth is a dead tie between two creatures one is um is tyrannosaurus rex Tyrannosaurus rex has really big teeth. Now, and that's not just the, the tip that you see, it's got a root in it that goes up to two feet. Um, about the same size is the tooth of Liviatan melvilli, which is a giant whale, a giant uh, sperm whale. And they are, they basically ate other whales. So they were a very scary creature, lived around the same time as Megalodon. And they had two foot teeth as well, um, but much beefier and I think scarier teeth than T-Rex. Excuse me, Mr. Um, I have another question. Me, mm. uh, uh. There's lots of people asking at the same time. Can we have uh, Arudith first? Uh, Imarka, you can ask a question. Great. Well, a great white shark versus a Zyphactinus. Who would have a, big, a better chance? Uh, what was the first part there? The great white shark and the Zyphactinus. Zyphactinus and great white shark. Uh, I don't know uh, because they lived at very different time periods. Great white shark is only around 6 million years old. Um, whereas uh, Zyphactinus is a, a fish from the Cretaceous uh, period 65 million years ago, uh, up to like 120 million years ago at the time of the dinosaurs. Um, and I think great white shark would probably win because we, as I fact, this is a very toothy fish. We have a lot of toothy fish today um, in, the, in our oceans um, and sharks eat most of them. Um, but I do want to note that sharks aren't always the top predator in their ecosystem. I mentioned that Liviatan melvilli, sometimes that probably ate sharks. Um, sharks eat other sharks. Uh, during the time of the dinosaurs, sharks were definitely not the apex predator. They were marine reptiles like mosasaurs that ate sharks on the regular. Um, so I know sharks are scary, um, but some of them are, are, uh, are sometimes they are not the, the key predator. And sometimes they're also pretty small. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Mason. Uh, guys, uh, uh, the thing is, uh, Mr. Mason uh, was is not actually in his dome, so he had to leave because uh, there was some issue with the timing. So, we'll ask these questions in the uh, upcoming lessons since uh, we don't have enough time and it's pretty inconvenient for Mr. Mason as well. So thank you, Mr. Mason, for all those answers that you gave. It was very enlightening, and the question uh, and the students were able to ask a lot of questions. So thank you very much for that. And uh, with that, I would like to announce a few things and wrap up the session. So first, I would like to say uh, that we will be having uh, uh, an explore. Uh, hold on, yeah, a lunar eclipse observation in May. So that's. The next month so the upcoming month by the german planetarium using live telescope so we will be given opportunity to uh, you know observe this lunar eclipse with them so that's a great opportunity for you guys 
Uh, so we will let you know when will that be taking place. So please stay tuned. And along with that, again, I would like to thank Mr. Mason. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mason, because I heard that there was some issue with the time zone. So even though uh, you are not in your dome, you still managed to join. So thank you very much. We appreciate your time and concern. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Mason. Uh, kids, I know that you guys have a lot of questions relating to astro uh, astronomy as well as paleontology. So don't worry, we'll be starting our classes from next week, Sunday. Uh, as you know, today is a preparatory class. So it's just an introduction. Uh, but from next week onwards, we'll be starting the actual classes. So you guys huh? can ask all the questions uh, then, Good. right? Yes. What time will, it start, will the class start next week? Yeah, it will be starting at the same time, 7.30, yeah. and we'll be finishing at 9.30, yeah. Sri Lanka time. And also, I would like to uh, tell you guys that many other foreign professionals, right? So they will also be joining us in this program uh, for astronomy as well as for paleontology, right? So they'll be talking about various topics and also answer questions that you guys have. So please stay tuned and uh, keep the curiosity going. And again, I would like to thank Mr. Mason. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. Would Dr. Julie Thanks for inviting me. Yes, of course, Dr. Julian Onions and other professionals from, uh, you know, astrophysicists, paleontologists, so many people will be joining us in this uh, advanced astronomy camp because it's six months long, right? So we have so much time, plenty of time for so all of them to join. We have on 28th of uh, April now. Sorry? We have a birthday on 28th. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, that's right. On 28th. So, yeah, guys. So, we will wrap up today's session. Uh, thank you for joining. So, I'll see you all uh, next week, Sunday. And thank you very much, Mr. Mason, for your time. Uh, I hope it was not a, a problem. So, sorry if there was any inconvenience with the timing. Uh, oh, really no sorry. problem. So, uh, all right. so, <laughs> happy to be here. Happy to be here. Thank you very much. So hoping to see you on the upcoming sessions as well. Bye, guys. Bye. Sir, bye. Goodbye, sir. Bye, Mr. Mason. Bye, Mr. Mason. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye, bye. Bye.